Well, good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill. So glad to see all of you here today. Those of you who are watching us online, thank you for inviting us into your home. It's our pleasure to be able to bring this message of encouragement to you. I wanna invite you to come and be with us sometime when you get the opportunity. We'd love to have you come and fellowship with us here in this faith community that we have. And others of you who may be watching me online a little bit later today or another time, I just wanna give you a shout out and say thanks for being here as well. Um, in 1983, a man by the name of John Scully left his prestigious post at PepsiCo and he took a risk by joining a little unknown upstart computer company. He had no guarantee that by being a part of this new startup company that he would have any kind of promised security financially, that there would even be a, a future. The name of this upstart computer company was called Apple Computer. And he had no idea what would happen there. He had security, he had investments, he had a life that was set at PepsiCo. But the co-founder of um, Apple Computer, Steve Jobs, came to him one day and he said, this question he asked me caused me to leave my job and join Apple. Here was the question he asked. He said, John, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water? Or do you want to take a chance that will change the world? He said he went home and he thought about that. He said, do I really want to spend the rest of my life selling sugared water? Or can I be a part of a vision and a movement that could possibly change the world? Well, John Scully took that, that invitation and joined Apple Computers. And we know about Apple and Mac and all the products today. When I think about the original 12 disciples of Jesus, they were a misfit bunch of men. They were uncouth, they were uneducated, they were not trustworthy, they were fearful of their own shadows. They followed Jesus for three years and even at the one point where Jesus needed them the most, what did they do? They ran and they hid. They ran for their life. These men that Jesus poured his life into for three years who were supposed to turn the world upside down in the moment of crisis, they fled and they ran away. And yet after the resurrection of Jesus, and after his appearing to them and giving them some instruction, on the day of Pentecost, something happened. They were miraculously transformed. These men who were afraid of everything became some of the most courageous men in the Christian movement. These men who were afraid of their own shadows were not afraid of governors and rulers. These men who had no power in and of themselves suddenly became filled with power that was unexplainable. What did they do? Did they, did they take leadership classes from John Maxwell and the 17 unrefutable laws of leadership? Did they buy Craig Rochelle's new book um, you know, about leadership? No. The thing that changed their lives and it turned their lives upside down, which enabled them to turn the world upside down was their encounter with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, who so radically transformed them that they were never the same. And I, and I think about that question that Steve Jobs asked John Scully. And I think about the question that maybe the Holy Spirit might ask us in an even greater way. Are you content as a child of God to live the rest of your life pushing the sugary trinkets of the world? Or do you want to follow me and change the world? That is the question for every child of God. Because as a child of God, we are followers of Christ and we're called to live like he does. Now, last week we started a first of a four-part series that we're calling Empowered the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And last week, as we began looking at this whole impact of the Holy Spirit in our life, we had to begin by looking at the identity of the Holy Spirit. Who is he? 
If we're going to live effectively in the power of the Holy Spirit, we have to clearly understand who he is from the teaching of scripture. And so we had this theological approach last week as we looked at who is the identity of the Holy Spirit. And for us to have a relationship with him, we've got to begin there. And last week we looked at a three specific truths about the Holy Spirit. The first is the Holy Spirit is a definite person. He is not an it. He's not an impulse personal force. He is a person. And as a person, he has emotion, he has intellect, he has will. The same as the Father, the Son, and same as you and I. So he is a person. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is a divine person. He is part of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is as omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent as is the Father and the Son. And the third thing we saw is that the Holy Spirit is a dynamic person. He's a powerful person. And his, his dynamic character is to be poured in the lives of those who follow him, which means that we are to be dynamic and powerful as well. Well, today, as we continue in looking at the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, last week we looked at his identity. Today, what I want to talk to you about is his impact in the life of a believer. His impact in the life of an unbeliever. And in order for us to understand the impact that the Holy Spirit has in the person's life, then what we have to do is we have to really go back before our salvation. We got to look at how the Holy Spirit has worked in our salvation and how the Holy Spirit works in our life all the way through eternity. Because the impact of the Holy Spirit is not at just one point. It's all through our life as a believer. And so if we're going to live in the power of the Spirit of God, we need to understand how he impacts us and what he wants to continue to do in our lives as believers. So where do we start? I think a great place to start is in the book of Ephesians. So take your Bibles, open to Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And when we look at Ephesians, we're looking at the crown jewel of Paul's writings. This is one of my favorite books in the New Testament. Next to that is Romans and in Colossians. I just love these books because Paul begins with, with really deep theology and then he moves to practicality. He gives us orthodoxy and he moves us to orthopraxy. And what we see here is he's laying out what we were like before we were believers and followers of Christ and how the Holy Spirit impacted us in our lostness, in our salvation, and in our continued faithfulness to him. So here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter two, beginning in verse one. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. That's the case of every human being. We are born spiritually dead. That means we cannot respond on our own to spiritual stimuli any more than a corpse can respond to any kind of physical stimuli. We were born spiritually dead, but it gets worse. And we were following the course of this world. We're dead, we're following the patterns and the culture of the world, and that's the way that we're living our lives. But it gets worse. We were following the prince of the power of the air. We were under the control of the enemy of Satan. So we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're following the course of the world and Satan is our master even though we don't recognize it. Thirdly, I mean fourthly, the spirit that is now at the work in the sons of disobedience. So we're disobedient. And then it gets even worse. Now let's go to verse three. Among whom we all once lived the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of men. We were in bad shape. We were dead men and women walking is what we were. We're dead in our trespasses. We're living by the course of the world. We, we are under the control of the evil one. We live by our flesh and our passions and our desires and we are under the wrath of a holy God. That's the state of all of humanity left to ourselves. But here's the wonderful news. God doesn't leave us to ourselves. The Holy Spirit of God, by the design of the Father, brings him into our lives. And what is the first thing that the Holy Spirit does in the life of every person who knows Jesus? We understand 
that God brings life. Look at verse four, one of the greatest adversatives in the Bible, but God. Being rich in mercy because of the great love which, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. But God, you were dead, but God. You were following the course of the world, but God. You were under the control of Satan, but God. You were living by your passions and your own desires, but God. You were a child of disobedience and wrath, but God, because of his mercy, in which he loved us. What does he do? He sends the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit's work that pulls us out of this darkness. It's the Holy Spirit's work that pulls us out of this death. It's the Holy Spirit's work that opens up our spiritually blind eyes and we can see. Here's the first thing that the Holy Spirit does in the life of an individual to come to know Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit regenerates the believer's heart for conversion. The very first thing the Spirit of God does is he moves into a person's life and he begins to bring this conviction of sin. Why? Because when you and I are spiritually dead, we cannot see spiritual things. We cannot respond to spiritual stimuli. As I said earlier, we're lost and we don't even know it. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he says, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever so that they do not see the glory of the gospel. The enemy is working hard to keep people spiritually blind and they don't see the glory of the gospel. Listen, here's the thing. They don't don't understand and comprehend how good the gospel is. Why? The gospel is good news for bad people. Here's why they're blinded. Nobody thinks they're bad. Have you noticed that? Nobody thinks they're bad. I remember my life before Christ came in. I was pretty good, I thought. I went to mass every Sunday. I went to catechism on Saturdays. I went to confession probably once a month. And and I was a pretty good kid. Yeah, did I do drugs? Sure I did. Did I abuse alcohol? Yes. Was I promiscuous? Absolutely. But I was pretty good compared to really, really, really bad people. (laughs) And here's the problem with humanity. We measure our goodness based on other people's badness. But God measures our goodness based upon his perfection. And I could never stand. And I'm living the life. I'm having a great time. I'm just looking for the next party, the next drink, the next drug, the next relationship. And I'm just, I'm just living it up. I'm all along thinking, hey, I'm pretty good. Until that one night in March where I went to that church and the Holy Spirit of God began to do something that I'd never experienced in my life. All of a sudden, I saw my sin. I'd never seen it before. All of a sudden, at that moment, I knew the judgment that was waiting for me if I die in that sin. And in that moment, I came to know, wow, Jesus is the answer. Now, there were people around me who were about falling asleep in that sermon. I was just wanting to get out of the building And I remember hanging on to that pew and I made a deal with God. If this thing is real, you let Jerry Harris go down there and talk to that preacher. There went Jerry Harris. (laughs) I tried to think of a second clue, but I couldn't come up with one. I went down there. And it wasn't until the spirit of God began to regenerate my dead heart that I knew that I was lost. And I love what Paul writes in Titus. He says this, he saved us not because of works done by our righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The process of regeneration is this. God doesn't take a a, a sinful, broken heart and refurbish it. He doesn't remodel it. He doesn't reconstruct it. You know what he does? He gives you a new one a new heart, a spiritually new heart. 
And the process of regeneration is where the Holy Spirit comes in and he woos you and he convicts you and he enables you to see things that you've never seen before. Then all of a sudden, you know your own wretchedness and you know the righteousness of Christ. All of that is the work of the Spirit. It is not your education. Although God may use truth to teach you that, it is always the work of the Holy Spirit. And no person ever comes to a relationship with Jesus Christ apart from the Holy Spirit doing that work in them. Several years ago, I had a lady that was a young lady and she was a preschool teacher. And she came to me, she said, Pastor, I just need to talk to you. I need to tell you a little bit of my story. I started coming to this church because of a friend. I, I, I grew up as an atheist. All my friends were atheists. Nobody I knew believed in God. I didn't care about the things of God. I got married to a man who was an atheist. And as a result, as we were living our life, he left me for another woman and now we're divorced. And she said, I was distraught. I was broken. Somebody at work gave me a little devotional book. And she said, I've never read about God before. And I, in my, my brokenness, I started reading. Then all of a sudden, she said, I started being hungry. I want to know more about God. I couldn't figure this out. Wait a minute, I don't believe in God. Why, why am I reading this? She said, I kept coming back to this and somebody invited me to Scott's Hill and I started coming. And every time you preach and the music, I'd leave, I'd cry. I'd cry, I'd go home and I'm thinking, I can't stop thinking about God. And she sat in my office. She said, what do I do with this? I said, let me tell you, that's God chasing you. That's the Holy Spirit wanting you and he's about to change your life. What he's calling you to do is surrender to him. And she prayed and surrendered her life to Christ and the cutest thing, she looked up at me and she said, am I a Christian now? <laughs> she said, I've never been a Christian before. And God radically changed her life. Why? Because the regenerative work of the Spirit of God. If you're a child of God, your salvation did not begin with you. It began with him. From eternity past, the father chose you in him before the creations of the world. Jesus went to on the cross to die and pay the price for your sin to reconcile you to himself. And then the Holy Spirit comes along and he's the one that's been speaking to your heart and drawing you and changing your life. The whole Trinity is involved in your salvation. And the Holy Spirit is the one who brings you to this point. It's called regeneration. And nobody comes to faith in Christ unless the Spirit of God begins to do his work. So I want to say this. Your salvation begins with the Spirit of God. But it doesn't stop there. Here's the second thing we need to understand about the Holy Spirit. Not only does he bring regeneration that prepares us for, for salvation, but the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the believer at conversion. When a person surrenders their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, at that moment, the Holy Spirit takes up residency within you. Now, let me just say something about regeneration and conversion. Sometimes regeneration may take a little longer and then that person submits their life, surrenders, and by faith receives Christ and becomes a child of God. For me, it all happened in one night. I mean, it happened quickly. For some of you, it may have taken a little longer as the Holy Spirit was drawing you along and you came to that place where you surrendered your life to him. But regardless of the time frame, the moment you surrender your life, the Holy Spirit takes up residency within you. When the Holy Spirit moves in, there are three things he does in every believer. Here's what we need to remember. And I want to give you these three things. Number one, he indwells the believer at conversion. The Holy Spirit comes in and he indwells every believer. Jesus said this to his disciples in John chapter 14. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And then Paul puts it this way. He says in Ephesians 2, in him you also are being built together a dwelling place for God in the spirit. And then we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? When the Holy Spirit moves into your life, then there is life. Some of you probably saw these gloves sticking out of my pocket and you're thinking, I know y'all keep it cold in here, come on. <laughs> but these gloves are a great, great picture 
of what happens at conversion. This is a person before the Holy Spirit has brought conviction and conversion. It's like a glove. It has the form of a hand, but it can do nothing. In and of itself, it is absolutely useless to accomplish anything. That's what we are before the convicting work of the Spirit of God. But when the Holy Spirit begins to convict us and we submit our lives to Jesus, he comes in and he takes residency. All of a sudden, there is animation. I'm gonna stop there. I might accidentally do something I shouldn't do. There's animation. There's power. There's life. And when the Holy Spirit comes in and takes up residency within a child of God, you suddenly have the life of God in you. Here's the difference between those without the Spirit and those who have the Spirit. And when we talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we're really speaking about power. And when the Holy Spirit comes in and takes up residency within a believer, all of a sudden there is power. As he indwells us, there's power to overcome sin like you've never had before. There's power to overcome temptation. There's power to dis, um, refuse to believe and to resist the enemy, the devil. There's power for you to overcome anxieties or depression or other issues in your life. There's power that we've never had before because the Holy Spirit, the very power of God, the very Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. And there it is, he in you with incredible power. The world apart from Christ looks like this. The believers or to be like this. And what a distinct difference, isn't there? So when we talk about him indwelling you, we're talking about power. But there's a second thing that happens. Not only do we find that he indwells us, he baptizes the believer at conversion. Not only are we indwelt by the Spirit of God, but we are baptized into the Spirit of God at conversion. Here's how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body where the Jews are Greeks, where the slaves are free, and we are all made to drink one spirit. Now, when you come to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, different denominations have different positions on this. And they are vastly different. There are charismatic brothers and sisters of ours that would say, oh, baptism of the Holy Spirit is a subsequent blessing that happens after you've been saved and after you've been indwelt by the Spirit of God. You should seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then these certain signs will follow, such as speaking in tongues and all kinds of spiritual gifts. Many people believe that. But here's the interesting thing. Nowhere in the scripture are we ever commanded to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in scripture are we ever commanded to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're commanded to be baptized by water as a personal testimony of our faith in Christ, but we're never commanded to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens to every single believer at the moment of conversion. Not only are you indwelt by the Spirit of God, but you are baptized by the Spirit of God, and that baptism is an initiation into the body of Christ. Here's the problem when you see it as a subsequent baptism. When you see it as a subsequent blessing, you create an elitism in the church. Well, I have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but you don't. And you need to start seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you want to be like me. And if you don't seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will never be able to do what I do. The whole context of this passage here is because the church in Corinth was believing that. And what Paul is saying is no, 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 no. Every single child of God, regardless of your heritage or your giftedness, we are all baptized into one body because the Holy Spirit is the one who does this work. And here's what it means. Not only does the Spirit of God dwell in me, but that same Spirit dwells in you. And because of that, we are baptized together in his body and there is unity among us. And so we all walk with the Spirit of God. We're 
Indwelling speaks of the power of the Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit speaks of our position in Christ. But here's the third thing. Not only do, are we indwelt, not only are we baptized at the moment of conversion, this is great. He seals the believer at conversion. Every child of God is sealed by the Spirit of God at conversion. Here's what it, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 13 and 14, he says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, notice the progression here, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed in him and were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, he says a couple of things. Number one, we're sealed. What does that mean? The word seal was a sign of authentication and ownership. If there was an important document to be sent, there was always a seal. Hot wax would be melted, and the owner of that with his signet ring would put that signet in that hot wax. And whenever it would be sent, it was a sign of authentication and ownership. Every child of God... Every person who surrenders to faith in Christ, when the Holy Spirit comes in, he seals you and you are authenticated as being owned by the Father of the universe. You are his. And the Holy Spirit in you is God's design of saying, see him, see her, they are mine. And they are sealed with my spirit. But it even gets better than that. He says, guarantee of our inheritance. The guarantee of our inheritance means this. You know what that word guarantee means? The literal rendering in the Greek is a down payment. If you're going to buy a car and you put a down payment, that's the first of the installments. You have begun the process of owning and paying for that automobile. When the Holy Spirit is put into you, not only are you sealed by God that you belong to him, but that he is the down payment of your salvation. And God is saying it can never be lost. You are his forever. And the price that has been paid was the blood of his son and the investment of the spirit of God living in you. Isn't that wonderful? Here's what it means. That not only does he indwell you and give you power, not only does he baptize you and give you position, but he also, sealing of the Holy Spirit, speaks of his permanence. You are his forever. A person who has genuinely been saved and sealed with the Spirit of God cannot and will not lose their salvation because they are sealed with the very promise of God and the very presence of his power in his life. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean they don't have seasons of sin. Doesn't mean they don't have times of coldness. But God has transformed the heart. He's given a new heart. He has given the presence of the Spirit of God and we are his forever. So when the Holy Spirit is working in the life of a believer, the first thing he does is he brings regeneration. Then he brings conversion with the Spirit's indwelling and baptism and sealing. Now, most believers say, great, I'm happy about that. And we stop right there. But there's a third thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do. You see, the indwelling, the baptism, and the sealing are one-time events. They happen at your conversion. They do not happen again. They're one-time events. But there's something that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us that he wants to do over and over and over and over. And here's a third thing. The Holy Spirit desires to feel the believer after conversion to fill us with his presence. Ephesians chapter five, verse 18, Paul says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit of God. This is not a command not to ever drink. It's not a prohib pro prohibition against drinking. It's a prohibition against being drunk with wine. Why? Wine is a depressant. The Holy Spirit is a stimulant. And rather than being filled with wine, we are to be filled with the Spirit of God. Rather than being filled with the things of the world, we are to be filled with the Spirit of God. Now, I hear people say sometimes, oh, I just need more of the Spirit. 
I just need more of the spirit. Let me just say this. When at conversion, you get all of the spirit there is. The question is, does he get all of you? That's the difference. Let me give you an illustration. Several years ago, Hurricane Matthew was gonna be blowing through. And, and if you live out here at Southeast North Carolina very long, you will own a generator at some point. And, and, and maybe you own one that even runs. So the, the hurricane is coming and my views, my generation, my, my generation, my generator for generations, I've used my generator for years now. And so what I did was I filled that generator completely up with gas. The tank was full. It takes about seven gallons. I couldn't get any more in. Put the cap on it and I started pulling and I started pulling and I'm pulling and I'm pulling and that generator won't start. It would not start. My neighbor saw me pulling. He felt bad. He came over and started pulling too. He's pulling. He's pulling. He said, I don't know what's wrong with that. Maybe you need more gas. I said, no, it's full. It's completely full. Can't put another drop in. Then I realized the, the, the valve was turned off <laughs> from the flow of the gas tank to the carburetor. And I just said, oh, there it is. Turned the valve on. Pulled two times and that generator started up. Man, that was a beautiful sound. And a lot of times we're just like that. Here's the deal. The Holy Spirit is in us, but there's something in our life that's keeping him to flow freely so that we can experience the fullness of God in us. I wanna tell you what's grossly missing in our churches today. I'm gonna to tell you what's grossly missing in believers' lives today. It's something that they hear about, but they have no idea how it can be a reality in their life. And it is living in the fullness of the Spirit of God. And God wants every believer, every child of his to live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And there's something that's keeping that, that flow of the Holy Spirit. We don't need more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is demanding more of us so that he can work through us. I want to show you just a couple of essentials that Paul brings out here. The essentials of the spirit-filled life is living a spirit-filled life is a command. It is a command. Here is the literal rendering in the Greek. Allow yourselves to be filled with the spirit. You cannot fill yourself, but you have to allow yourself to be fully filled by the spirit of God. So it's a command for every child of God. It is a command for you and me to live according to the fullness of God. But secondly, living a spirit-filled life is for the church. It's plural. You all allow yourselves to be filled with the spirit. This is not some elite position for only those who have received a certain subsequent grace from God. This is for every child of God. And for the whole body, we are to live in such a way that we're constantly allowing the Spirit of God to flow through every aspect of my life that he empowers everything I experience. Vance Havner, a great old preacher and commentary of years gone by, here's what he says. He says, the average Christian is so subnormal that when he becomes normal, everybody thinks he's abnormal. Being filled with the Holy Spirit should be the normal experience of every Christian. That should be the normal experience because the Spirit of God lives in me. Here's the third thing we need to see about the essentials. Living a Spirit-filled life is to be continual. And here's the rendering in the Greek. You all keep on allowing yourselves to be filled with the Spirit. Indwelling, baptism, and sealing, one-time event. Being filled with the Spirit over and over and over again. Go through the book of Acts. Acts chapter two, and they were filled with the Spirit. Acts chapter four, and they were filled with the Spirit. Acts chapter eight, and they were filled with the Spirit. You go through the whole book of Acts, and you will find over and over, and they were filled, and they were filled, and they were filled. Because it is to be a continual action in my life. So we are to live in the fullness of the Spirit. Listen, it's one thing for us to celebrate the triune God in my salvation. It's another thing for me to celebrate the fact that he lives in me, I'm sealed, and I'm baptized into the body of Christ. It's a completely different thing. 
that every single day of my life, I give him the freedom and the access of my thoughts, of my words, of my actions. And every morning when I wake up, I say, Lord Jesus, I surrender to you. Holy Spirit, fill me today with all the fullness of God that I might not be satisfied with the trinkets of the world, but that you would use me to change my world. That's why churches are dying. That's why believers seem to be victor and not victorious because we're not living in the fullness of God. Now, what are the marks of a person who's living in the fullness of God? Let me give them to you. Paul gives them to us. The marks of a spirit-filled life. He says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even to God the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. He mentions several things here. Let me go through them very quickly. First thing, speech that is godly. People who are filled with the Spirit of God speak of godly things. Their speech is godly. Their speech refers to holiness. Their speech is something that builds people up rather than condemning people. You can always see a spirit-filled person and listen to their conversation and you will know that the spirit of God controls their tongue and their thoughts. Spirit-controlled people are people of godly speech. Here's a second thing. Singing that is glorifying. Now, I've heard some of you sing, and in my ears, it may not be that glorious. <laughs> and if you heard me, you would say the same thing. But it's more than just singing on tune. Here's what it is. It's having a melody in your heart. When people say, I just can't sing, preacher, that's why I sit like this. It's not that you can't sing. The question is, do you have a song? I love this, this one man. Every time I'm around him, he's humming humming, always humming, always singing, always doing things like that, always talking about the Lord. Why? Because there's a song in our heart and we can't help but just worship. The worship of God just exudes and flows out of us. And when we gather together, let me tell you, what happens on Sunday morning should be the culmination of everything you and I have been doing in the course of the week. We're just here as a crescendo of praise together for the glory of God. Here's the third thing, sincere gratitude. People who are filled with the Spirit are not complainers. They're not complainers. I just did a funeral for a man a couple of weeks ago. I said, this man was the epitome of a, a thankful heart. I, I said of him, I said, Mr. Fred's the kind of guy that if he has a flat tire, he'll jump out the car and say, praise Jesus, I got three tires with air. <laughs> I'm not saying they're not realistic, but there's a gratitude of thanksgiving to the Lord. And the last one, there's submission that is gracious. We submit to one another in the fear of Christ. Those are the marks of a spirit-filled life. So what do we do with all of this? If you're a child of God this morning, you have been regenerated. You were dead, but now you're alive. If you're a child of God this morning, you have been converted. The spirit of God indwells you. He has baptized you and he has sealed you until the day of redemption. And if you're a child of God, here's your part. Surrender to him that you might live a life that is filled with the spirit of God. How do you do that? How do we get there? Let me give you three things. Number one, yearn for his presence. Yearn for his presence. When's the last time You've cried out to the Spirit of God and said, Spirit, I, Holy Spirit, I need you. I need you. Not only for my salvation, but I need you that I might effectively live this life for your glory. Yearn for him. Recognize that you can't do anything in your flesh apart from him. Yearn for him. Secondly, Turn from your flesh. You want to know why many believers are not filled with the Spirit? Here's why. They're too full of themselves. And it's not until I empty myself of myself 
that the spirit of God can fill me with himself. He's already there. He's asking not just to be resident of your life, but to be president of your life. And you release to him. Third, yearn, turn, learn. Learn to yield to his will. Here's what we simply do to be filled with the Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, I yield to you. You know what a yield sign is? Many of you have seen them and you have no idea what they mean. <laughs> kind of like a speed limit sign. <laughs> yield simply means this. You don't have the right of way. Someone else has the right of way ahead of you. And when you come to that intersection, if someone else is coming along, you yield to their right of way. And in the Christian life, every single day, I yield to the Spirit's direction in my life. Amen. Holy Spirit, I yield to you today. You lead me. Holy Spirit, I really want to say this, but you guard me. And the Spirit-filled life may be mysterious to us, but it is so simple to God where he just says, let me have my way. So I'll ask you the question again. Are you content with pushing the sugary trinkets of the world? Or do you want to take a chance at changing the world? Within you, believer, is everything you need to be everything God wants you to be. But will you yield? Will you submit? Will you surrender today? For some of you, it means repenting of some sin right now that you know is in your life. For some of you, it's restoring a relationship that's been broken and God's calling you to restore it. For some of you, it may be trusting him more with your life, but simply coming to him and say, Father, thank you for calling me from eternity past. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Holy Spirit, thank you for changing me. Now I surrender. And every single day I wake up, I surrender. Why? Because for every child of God, there's civil war in your soul. There's your flesh, there's the spirit, and someone wants to win, and somebody's will will die that day. Will it be yours, or will it be God's? And if you're here this morning or watching and you're not a believer, listen to me. Some of you, the Holy Spirit's been doing some things in your life and in your mind and you're thinking and, and something's changing in you and you're fighting it and you're wondering, what's going on, my friend? Let me tell you, the very God of heaven is on your heels and he loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. He rose on the third day and he's seated at the right hand of the Father and Jesus and the Father have sent the Holy Spirit to convict you and to draw you to a place of forgiveness and eternal life. Yield to him and surrender your life to Christ by faith and the Spirit of God will do exactly what I said this morning and take control of your life for his glory and for your good but we must surrender. Church, are you ready to walk in the power of the Spirit of God? Are you ready to walk in the wisdom of the Spirit of God? Are you ready to walk in the endurance of the Spirit of God? Then empty yourself of yourself and surrender fully to Him. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your work through eternity past. Thank you for your work on the cross through your son. And thank you for your work in the Holy Spirit right now within us. And Father, may we yield to you. For those who are without Christ, may they surrender right now. 
throw up their hands and surrender and say, I surrender. I see Jesus is my only hope. He's the only one who can forgive me of my sin. I see the judgment that waits for me if I do not receive him. And now I surrender everything. And Father, for those who are believers, may we not be content and living in our flesh, but living by the power of your spirit who is alive in us. Father, may you transform our lives even now for the glory of God. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.